musical chair. So who's in Cohen 1500? Awesome, you're in the right place. Um, thank you guys for coming to the faculty panel. Those of you who showed up in person, you will learn this is a really great student skill that will serve you well. Those of you recording or viewing our recording online, thanks for joining us. Um, we have five faculty members here tonight from different disciplines, and you're going to have a chance to ask them questions about those fields, anything you're wondering about engineering. Before we do that, I want to ask you a couple questions. How many of you think you know your major? You're pretty sure you think you know? Okay, maybe like half. And how many of you really don't know? You're kind of struggling. You need a little help there, figuring out your major. Okay, great. This is a great. This is the right class for all those hands. Um, how many of you are first year students? Awesome, great. This is the right class for you. Um, look around, find someone you don't know. This is going to be people you're studying with the next few years, and introduce yourself. Meet someone new in the class. Okay, let's come back together. I want to ask you all quickly, how many of you have started the assignment, the right assignment this week where you're going to put out your course plan for the next few years? A few of you. Um, especially for those of you who, who don't know what you want to major in, don't freak out about that. This doesn't have to be what you're taking. This is your best guess at things you might want to take and you can change your mind. I want to strongly encourage you to start that sooner than later. We had a couple um, students in office hours today asking great questions about it and it can be a little confusing if you haven't done it before. It's kind of different than how you do your schedule in high school. So try and start that and if you have any questions about it, come see us in office hours tomorrow at 1.30 on thir Thursday for those of you watching online. And then um, or go see your advisor because that's what they're here to help you with. But try and start that sooner than later because if you start it on Sunday, you're going to kick yourself that you don't have enough time. Okay, so without further ado, I want to introduce or have our faculty members introduce themselves, tell you their field, the discipline that they're in, and a little bit about what their research entails. 
All right, so my name is uh, Peter Hamlington. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering. Uh, I actually did physics as an undergrad, and then my PhD is in aerospace engineering, and I ended up in mechanical. Uh, that kind of reflects how mechanical is a, a gathering place for a lot of uh, you know, different disciplines, which I'm happy to talk about more here. Um, my research is on computational fluid dynamics. Uh, we study a range of problems from you know, combustion in engines to wildfires to oceanography. Uh, we do some renewable energy research on uh, wind and ocean energy. Um, and, you know, like I said, uh, you know, in our department, we do a lot of different things, including bioengineering, uh, material science. Uh, there's some mechanics research, robotics research, uh, so lots of different things. Hi, my name is Rhonda Hainigman. I'm from the Department of Computer Science. And uh, my undergraduate degree was actually in journalism. Uh, and then I was a, a software engineer for 10 years and then went back to school and got a PhD in computer science. Um, and so now most of my, I spend most of my time now uh, teaching freshman classes. Um, my research area is in applied optimization problems, um, looking at uh, resource use, um, I've done some work looking at water use on landscape. So how would you come up with some optimal distribution of water, optimal distribution of plants in order to maximize growth? I've also looked at food waste and redistribution and saying, can we increase food donation to shelters and what would the costs be of, of better donation models? Um, in the Department of Computer Science, we do, we do all kinds of stuff. I mean, people typically think of robots and things like that with with CS, but um, in fact, there's a lot more going on. There are people like me who, who try to look at applications to social problems, you know, computational applications. There are people who are looking at education. Um, there are people doing robots. There are people doing, doing more math, more theoretical stuff. I mean, the, the options, there's, there's quite a few options in CS. Hi, good evening. I am Balaji Rajagopalan. I'm a professor in civil, environmental, and architectural engineering. Uh, I'm also the department chair, and as you can see in our name, we are pretty broad. Uh, we do everything from uh, building systems, chemistry, all the way to management, construction, and everything in between. My area of research is uh, looking at, uh, uh, I do several things, primarily uh, climate, large-scale climate, how does uh, large-scale climate impacts regional, so why, why is it last seven years, eight years, been drought in the Western US. Is it just a random event or is there something uh, that's animating it? Uh, so I understand those kind of uh, relationships and I also do big data analysis to try and identify patterns and features so that you can use that to predict uh, these kind of events and then incorporate them into water resource management. So I do a lot of work on the Colorado River in particular. The other area of research that I do uh, is also looking at uh, past climates, you know, what happened 10,000 years ago or 15,000 years ago, and what, are, what factors were responsible at the time, can we learn something uh, from there. So as you can see, we do quite diverse research using uh, uh, techniques, computer simulation techniques, uh, uh, and then a lot of lab work if you're in the environmental engineering. So I'm happy to talk about all of those as you have questions. Hello, uh, my name is Bob McLeod, Professor and uh, Chair of Electrical Engineering. I think breadth is going to be the theme we see here, so electrical engineering is similarly broad. Uh, we include people that worry about power systems, like an electric car, or control systems that might keep something flying straight up, or radio frequency, so wireless communication and things like that. Uh, I work up in the field of optics, which is electro electricity. It's just really, really high frequency. Right? Um, and my field is in the interaction of light and soft materials. That's things like transistors that might go inside your body to do computation and drug release uh, for health monitoring. Or uh, we're actually working right now on holograms. It'll go in your, uh, your head-mounted display that you'll all be watching us on uh, next year. All right, uh, I'm Adam Holowinski. I am on the faculty in the Chemical and Biological Engineering Department. I've been here since fall of 2015, so the second year at the university. Uh, I took a pretty straight, uh, typical route through just chemical engineering all the way, uh, but I did do two internships at, at major companies, so if you guys are 
curious about how things are in industry. I might have some perspectives on that too. Uh, my, my research group uh, focuses on energy conversion chemistries, uh, in particular uh, developing catalysts. Uh, does everybody know what a catalyst does? Okay, most of you. Um, and our focus is mainly electrochemical systems, so uh, mainly either taking fuels to electricity or using electricity to synthesize fuels. Uh, we do some more fine commodity chemical synthesis too, uh, but that's generally my area of research. And uh, I think chemical engineering as a whole is a lot more broad, of course. Uh, you know, there's, there's chemical engineering in, in industries ranging from petrochemicals to kind of uh, plastics and household chemicals to pharmaceutical industry. Uh, there's some in automotive, foods, um, you know, just, just about everything has chemical engineer behind it. So anyway, does that work? We have five faculty members here, all from different departments, and this is really a panel for you all. This is your chance to ask questions. I have plenty, but I'd rather that you ask ones that you're interested in. So I'm going to start and ask if anyone has a question they want to start with. This always happens. <laughs> yeah, in the yellow shirt, what's your name? Anthony. Anthony. So, um, Adam, you said <laughs> you were a chemical engineer. Uh, we have an assignment going for what the, our classes are for the next years. I want to be a chemical engineer, so what's the classwork look like? Uh, as far as the, the next year or through your whole career? Yeah, next year, however much you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so funny thing, I have not yet taught an undergraduate level course at the university, uh, but I, I do know uh, that, that you're going to start off, uh, there's, a, there's a general chemistry class for engineers, and then you take something called material and energy balances. Basically, you know, if I have a reactor or something and I'm throwing in this chemical and converting it from A to B, how much energy am I consuming? How much product am I getting out? Just, just being able to do the basic math behind that. Uh, that's your introductory course. Then you'll move on to things like thermodynamics and, and transport phenomena. Oh, sorry. Is it, I... <laughs> Thank you, Jarrell. <laughs> Yep, uh, so uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, so thermodynamics, transport, you know, so how heat moves through things, how fluids move through systems, uh, things like that. And then eventually you'll move on to do uh, like a design project. I think the, at the end of your senior year, you're basically designing a chemical plant. That's the kind of capstone project at the end of it. Cool, thank you. Yep. Great question. Other questions? Yes, Jerry. Oh, um, I've always had like a uh, interest in renewable energy. I was wondering like which major would be like the best fit for something like on the forefront of that. Uh, really, I guess the like, question. I might be a little biased here. You know, obviously there's a, you know, if, if you're going to do chemical engineering, uh, you're looking at alternative fuels, things like, uh, you know, synthesizing fuels from from biomass, um, or uh, taking fuels to electricity, fuel cells. Um, Potentially, the opposite of a fuel cell would be an electrolyzer. You're like splitting water and making hydrogen and using that as a fuel later down the road. Um, but there's a lot of other uh, aspects to to renewable energy. So I think electrical engineering is probably uh, a great spot. And I'm going to hand it over to Bob. Here. So we have energy in our department name, so that's that's something. Um, uh, so he just talked a lot about the generation. Uh, we'd get very involved, or we, you know, if you were coming to electrical engineering, on what do you do with it? Uh, you gotta store it, you gotta get it out across the grid, you gotta get it into that electric car, you gotta have the battery, you gotta manage it, you gotta switch it. Uh, so a lot of, the, the sexy part of renewable energy, renewable energy is making it, and about 99% of the rest of the work is doing things with it. Um, so that's where we come in. So there's also energy in, in, uh, in our department, um, as Bob was mentioning, once you put energy into the infrastructure, how do you then manage it in a smart way? For example, smart buildings, uh, where you are sensing various aspects 
of the building and then managing energy in an efficient manner so that you use less energy but at the same time get the optimal comfort, optimal uh, performance out of the buildings both for heating and cooling. So uh, that's something uh, faculty in our department in the arch architectural engineering program which is also known as the building systems and energy program primarily focuses on uh, looking at infrastructure related energy management. So I have a good friend who works at NREL in their data science department doing simulations on different, um, different chemicals. So they're trying to come up with some new material and before they invest all of the time and resources into actually building it, they're trying to simulate how it would perform. And so it's the same, I mean, they're looking for renewable materials. Um, so I think from a computational standpoint, it's all the simulations before you, before you go forward with something. Yeah, and so um, your question is a good one, but I would say that it may not be the right question. We see a lot of students uh, you know, across the departments that want to do renewable energy. Well, renewable energy includes you know, biofuels, solar, wind, ocean. Let's say we just pick wind. Well, I could be out on the turbines doing maintenance. I could be doing structural testing. I could be doing analysis of how that energy from the wind comes into the grid, uh, relate that to weather, climate conditions. I could be doing simulations. And so, you know, renewable energy, it's an important thing. It's, I think it taps into our desire to save the world, basically. That's why I think we hear a lot of students who want to do renewable energy. But my next question for them is, well, what kind of energy? Right? Because if you're doing solar, well, this is, in a large part, a material science problem. If you're doing uh, biomass or biofuels, this is a ChemBio problem. If you're doing wind, um, you could belong in an atmospheric and oceanic sciences department. You could belong in a mechanical engineering department. And so, you know, really what you're trying to do when you are an undergrad is learn skills, you know, learn fundamentals. Uh, maybe direct yourself towards a particular area of interest like programming or simulations or materials. And then you can set yourself up to go into a career uh, in renewable energy or something else or various types of renewable energy. Um, so really, I think, first and foremost, you should think about what you enjoy doing. You know, do you enjoy working with your hands, programming, uh, and so on? And then there will be opportunities for you, no matter what you choose, in the world of uh, renewable energy. So Jared's question brings up a really great point. When I asked how many of you are undecided about your major, there was a lot of hands. And it's kind of obvious why, because Jared has one topic he's interested in, and five professors in five different departments just said you could be in their department. So it's no wonder if you're having a hard time deciding. Um, do your best. The, this week you have videos from each of our majors, and those will go into a little bit more depth about kind of the topic you'll be studying in each of those departments. So those of you who are still confused, it's okay. Spend some time watching those videos this week, and think about if there's any other questions that might help you tonight. Questions? Yes, what's your name? Uh, I'm Colin. Colin? Yeah. Uh, I'm currently in computer science, but I watched all the videos and I was interested in, in mechanical and electrical too, because I'm into computers. How painful would that be switching from like computer science discipline sophomore year-ish into electrical or mechanical? Well, I'll just speak first since I have the mic. Uh, mechanical, we get a lot of transfer students. Um, Again, because I think if you're not sure what to do, uh, a lot of students end up in mechanical. Um, I don't think it would be difficult. Uh, it's quite possible that the courses you've already taken may carry over and satisfy some requirements in mechanical. Um, at the beginning of your sophomore year, you're not that far along yet. It's not like we're talking five or six years for you yet. Um, so I would encourage you to you know, talk to the undergraduate advisors in mechanical and electrical, and they could tell you more. And I'll hand it off to the electrical engineering and then the computer science, the defense. <laughs> the defense goes last. I agree with what he said. Um, 
We have a computer engineering degree within the department uh, that's probably fairly close, uh, requires some CS classes, et cetera. We actually have trouble getting our students into those classes because they're all full. So you may have taken a clever route. You know? <laughs> um, uh, but if you have, uh, you know, if you like software but want to get your hands more on hardware, uh, that might be something to look at. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's. Um, I think you should do what you enjoy. Um, and I know that we do get a lot of people coming over from mechanical. Uh, so there, there does seem to be a lot of fluidity between the majors. And especially early on, it, you know, I'm sure that first year is, it's, they got to all be pretty similar. You know, all the, the foundation is all there, right? Math and physics and whatever else. So I have a question. I'm curious if you could speak a little bit, each of you, about what students do when they graduate from your department. Uh, most students that graduate from our department do go to work as software engineers. Um, you know, they, um, they go to work at, I mean, I've had former students who've gone to work at Microsoft, they've gone to work at Google. Um, you know, they do, they develop applications, they develop software applications. Some students do go to graduate school, they go on to, uh, to research, um, but primarily they will go and, and work in an office and, uh, and be software engineers. Yeah, so uh, most of our students in mechanical engineering go into industry, uh, generally. Uh, the type of company they work for, it's varied. Uh, some will do consulting, some will go work for a biotech company, uh, some will go work for a renewable energy company, um, you know, either doing analysis or uh, just maintaining uh, wind turbines, solar panels, things like that. Um, you know, I don't think... Uh, there's really too much limitation on what you can do with the mechanical engineering degree. And I think that's also probably true for these other majors as well. Um, you're all well trained when you finish your undergraduate studies, but you're not so specialized yet that you can't you know, still branch out and do something that maybe you didn't expect uh, you would be qualified for. Yeah, so like in other fields, uh, most of our students end up in uh, consulting uh, in the industry. And they range from structural engineering, construction, water resources, environmental, uh, and some also en uh, enter into f federal agencies like uh, uh, Bureau of Reclamation and other agencies that hire civil engineers. Uh, constru structural and structural related uh, consulting is by far the most where our students end up. And then if you are in the Denver area, as you would have seen, so much construction that's happening around. And you know, pretty much all of our students are, have at least one, two jobs uh, when they graduate. Uh, so mostly, uh, mostly in, in the consulting field. Also, uh, as Peter was mentioning, that since you, are, since you will not be specialized, uh, the way people progress is through licensure. So you have to um, clear licensure examinations. Just like if you want to practice medicine, you have to have a medical license. So do for civil engineering in particular, there is licensure that you have to uh, apply, take exam, and, and get. Only then you can sign off on plans and, uh, and construction documents. So, so that's predominantly our part. And then some end up in graduate school. Um, boy, that's a really hard question to answer for electrical engineering. Um, there's not too many things these days, including yourself, that doesn't have electrical engineering in it. Um, I'm actually going to a conference of electrical engineering department heads in about a month, and we're all asking the question, why aren't students going into this degree? Because the demand is so outstripped the students we can produce. Um, so our students, you know, obviously go into industry, little companies like Apple and Twitter and Google. And, um, uh, a huge number have founded their own companies. Spark Fund, just down the road towards Longmont, is one of our grads. Uh, so the opportunities in electrical engineering are incredibly broad. There's more aerospace. In aerospace, there's more electrical engineers than there are aerospace engineers because most of it's a big flying computer. Um, and uh, that's what makes it go. Uh, there, yeah, there's some aerodynamics on the outside that a couple of people can handle 
Um, so the opportunities are really hard. You know, medical startups, um, uh, one of my favorite students, advisee, uh, is now a senior security engineer at Twitter here in town. Um, but he's already got a startup on the side trying to provide you gigabit ethernet through fiber around Boulder because uh, he's a bit of a hacker. Um, so, uh, yeah, government labs, startups, industry, kind of kind of anywhere, uh, just because uh, electronics are, are so ubiquitous these days. Yeah, so uh, chemicals are you know, arguably equally ubiquitous. And uh, I, I mentioned quite a few industries, I guess, when I, in my introduction, but uh, the majority of, of uh, bachelor's degree students in chemical engineering are going to end up in industries from uh, oil to pharmaceuticals to kind of traditional commodity chemical synthesis, plastics, um, biotech, auto industry, um, Really, really, the scope of your job, regardless of what what you know flavor of of chemical production you're in, is going to be either taking some say bench scale chemistry that's been developed, like some new synthesis that that a chemist came up with, and and turning that into an industrial scale manufacturing process. So, you know, some some fraction of the jobs are going to be focused on that translational aspect, and then others are going to be more. Uh, you know, optimizing something that's up and running, maintaining it, uh, stuff like that. And then, of course, some some fraction of our graduates are going to go on to graduate school. Um, I think if if you want to do something research focused, and and kind of be in charge of the direction the research is going, then graduate school tends to be uh, the direction you need to go for that. I don't see any questions. I'm going to keep asking. Yes. What's your name? Andy. 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 Uh, what special abilities uh, should engineers have in order to succeed in this uh, in the future? Uh, I'm especially what? Abilities. 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 Sure. I, I'm holding the mic, so I'll start. So, um, you know, obviously you're going to cover a lot of textbook material, uh, and you should know that stuff. Um, the The two things that I think kind of separate people in, in any job. Uh, one is going to be communication skills, so, so writing effectively, uh, presenting effectively. You know, you can have the greatest idea if you can't kind of win people over and, and show them its merits, you're going to have a hard time. Um, you know, you got to be able to speak up at meetings and, and really convey, convey your thoughts. And, and so the second half of that is, is being proactive. Uh, I think if you sit around and wait for your boss to say, you know, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, and micromanage you, uh, they're going to get frustrated that they're spending a lot of time kind of directing your work and you're making more work for them. So it's, it's people who are going to take initiative, find the things that need to be done, go pursue them, and then, you know, come to management with the answer rather than what should I work on. I think we'll probably give you a range of answers here, so you'll have to pick and choose the ones you like. Um, uh, I was actually sitting next to the chief recruiter for Lockheed Martin uh, at dinner a couple nights ago. They made a big donation to our department in aerospace. Uh, they've hired 500 of our graduates just for one of their facilities here in Colorado, our, our, our department's uh, graduates. So they're an enormous employer of our people. And I asked her that question. I said, they, they, they go on um, interview tours, and they make the job uh, offer in the interview. You know, you finish a half an hour interview, they say, here's your job offer. And I asked, what's the one thing you look for that really gets people, you know, really hooks you? And her answer was passion. That you're passionate about, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, and that's actually not a bad way just to think about your education here. You can be passionate about X. Tomorrow you can be passionate about Y, and that's okay. Um, but if you do it, and uh, that's what they were looking for, because those people, kind of following up what he said, those people are going to drive, and they're going to succeed, and they're going to communicate, because they are really excited about what they do. Sort of on the same vein, uh, the advice I give, and something that I follow is that, be very curious. Curiosity is one uh, important trait that if you can build, 
uh, especially in your undergrad, that will serve you very well, any be it either job or, or uh, you're doing research or what have you. Wherever you are, if you're curious, you always tend to pick up and you're much more inquisitive about various things and then the passion passion follows through. The other thing also I, I tell students is be like a sponge. Absorb everything that you can. Uh, because in this day and age, when everything is interrelated, uh, you, you no longer can just be specialized in one area without looking at the implications across. So be, be curious and be like a sponge, and you'll go very far. <laughs> I'm going to say persistence, because I've, I've seen so many students who um, come to see you and they, they hit a struggle, right? They hit something in a class and it's hard, and they think, well, if this is hard, then this must not be the right major for me. And they, they go and they look for something else that might be easier. And what they don't realize is that it's, everybody's going to hit some struggle at some point. And you just have to stay focused and work through it. And if it's something that you, you care about and you're passionate about and you really want to do it, you know, you will, you will get it, right? You will, you will work through it. You will finally understand it. So um, I, think, I think persistence is, is key. And the stuff that you learn here, you know, we're not going to tell you exactly what you will ever need to know throughout your entire career, right? There will always be times when you're learning new stuff, the technology is going to change, the field's going to change, and you have to learn how to, how to learn new things and, and to persist through new material. Yeah, and my answer uh, is not too different than the previous four. Um, you know, we're not an industry, but we do hire... Uh, new graduates in the form of graduate students. And it's extremely difficult, I have to admit, to figure out who is going to be a successful PhD student. But uh, you know, what I found is that whether it's graduate school, PhD research, or a job, there are tough times. There are dark, lonely nights where you're in the lab doing work and nothing's working. And you have to find some way to be persistent, like Rhonda said, and keep going. And so what I try to do is look for you know, whether a student has some internal motivation. Is it that they are curious, like Balaji said? Is it that they are passionate about what they're doing, like Bob said? Um, is it just that you know, it doesn't even matter what they're doing? They just like programming. Just the act of programming is calming to them, and they enjoy it. And I think that if you have that motivation, um, if you have decided this is the thing for you, then you're able to get through these tough times and you're going to be successful in your job. And so I really try to dig deeper with the students that want to work with me and figure out, you know, why is it that you're doing this? Do you have a good solid reason that will get you through these tough times? And, you know, making money, that's not going to necessarily get you through tough times. Maybe if it's really good money, but uh, you know, just some rent, it's not going to get you through those tough times because it's the next thing to do because you feel like you should go to industry, you should go to grad school. These aren't good reasons. So you know, I really look for that, that spark and that, that motivation that will make you successful. The, the answers you just heard to Amy's question are the entire point of this class. This class, for those of you who don't know your major, we want you to find your passion. Find the thing that's going to get you excited and make you curious and be like a sponge. Find that one thing here at CU that's going to do that for you. And then afterwards, you can actually, as you heard with, with Peter's background, you can actually go into different fields. But find the thing that's going to excite you while you're here. And Rhonda's point about persistence is really important because you all were really good students in high school. That's why you're here. But you are going to have challenges here. And one of your assignments in this class is actually to interview someone who is more senior than you and ask them about their challenges and how they got through it. Because we want you to be prepared for it and ready to tackle it and stand back up if you fall down. So know that that's probably going to happen. It happens to everybody else. It happened to all these faculty. I almost guarantee you. And it's totally OK. Find your passion so you can stick through it. What other questions? Yeah, I'm right sure. Andrew. Andrew. So, uh... In the next decade or so, uh, what uh, industry or field do you think that'll be uh, experienced the most growth technologically and then also um, in terms of personnel? So I guess I can start, and I suspect my answer is going to be somewhat influenced by the areas 
in which I work. Um, you know, I really see, um, I mean, I do think renewable energy of various types is going to become a more and more important area. Uh, there's some uh, governmental regulations that are driving jobs and funding and certain research areas like biofuels. Um, I also think that uh, we live in an age of data, uh, too much data. Um, you know, we don't specifically study uh, how to manage big data, but you know, the simulations we perform, we have terabytes, in some cases petabytes of data that we have to manage. And um, there is information, there is insight to be learned from all of this data. And I think that uh, you know, studying it, uh, developing new ways to get these insights. You know, I see that as a big area now and one that I, we're not going to enter an age of less data. I think it's, it's only going to keep increasing. I think that all fields are actually just merging into computer science. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with Peter. It's going to be all about data, data, uh, data analysis, data security. Um, I think that's actually issues of data security are going to become m bigger and bigger over time. Infrastructure is very important. So uh, American Society of Civil Engineers ranked our nation's infrastructure and they gave it a D. So which means uh, it's very soon, much of it has to be replaced, renewed. And if you, you know, if you, travel overseas, you'll see, you know, our infrastructure, which used to be the, the, uh, the, the beacon, is suddenly looking like third world infrastructure. So that's what we tell our students that uh, soon you have to pay the piper and the infrastructure, things have to be replaced. Uh, and we also tell civil engineering is what makes everything else possible, right? So when, when you flush the toilet, stuff magically disappears, you open the tap, and uh, and drink the water straight. Those things don't happen magically. And because you can take those things granted is what everything else is possible. So in terms of making, uh, in, in terms of infrastructure, how do you build infrastructure that is in harmony with the environment? That's a big thing going forward, at least in, in, in civil engineering. The other thing that Peter touched upon, and which something that I work on a lot is, big data, there is just data everywhere, and sometimes more data, or more data than you need, or more data than you know what to do with. And so which means no longer civil engineering is simply, I'll just learn how to design a building, but you also need to know how to do modeling, how to take all this data coming in. The buildings and infrastructure are now becoming like breathing and living objects. Uh, so they are telling things on a real-time basis, how do you then make sense of it so that you manage these infrastructure better so that you don't have to, you, you, you can save on repairs uh, and, and also keep the cost down. So there's lots of exciting things and I, I do agree with Rhonda in some sense that uh, much of that is, uh, it does have computer science and computer science techniques in there. So it's, it's this interdisciplinary that is where I see um, the engineering kind of heading forward. That's an awesome question, and it's very forward-thinking. Uh, so I think that that's a, a great insight, just even to think about you know, what's coming. Um, I think the next 20 years in electrical engineering are going to be fascinating, and I'm really excited to see it. Uh, have you heard of Moore's Law? Oh, man. Um, so uh, it's this thing called the transistor, um, and the fact that uh, our computers have been getting about twice as powerful every 18 months since the late 1960s. So there's more computing power in the little plug-in power supply in your Apple computer or, or whatever than was on the Apollo mission that went to the moon. Um, the power supply. So everything, that's what supplies, you know, it lives underneath all this data, everything is getting exponentially more powerful because we're making circuits exponentially smaller. The latest generation is 11 nanometers. Would you like to know how many molecules that is across? That many. So it's not going to double too many more times. Um, and there's a little place called Silicon Valley, which is kind of freaking out about this. Um, 
So there's uh, carbon nanotube transistors, and there's quantum computing, and there's, there's uh, computing now is also communication. Everybody wants it all wireless and connected up together, but there's only so much spectrum. So everything is going like this, but there's these walls that we can just see coming. And that doesn't mean that's going to smack into a wall. It means the opportunities are incredible, and people are going nuts figuring out what's the next thing. And so I think it's going to be a very exciting time, and I think our discipline's probably going to be very, very different uh, in your career. You'll get to live through that transition. All right, so I, I definitely agree with the, the general sentiment that, that uh, informatics and data manipulation and uh, computer science are going to be increasingly uh, prevalent. Uh, and of course, the alternative energy sector is, is hopefully going to, to continue to grow, and that's going to be providing a lot more opportunities for people who don't necessarily love to code. Um, I guess if I was going to provide a unique answer, I might say biotechnology. You know, so the original uh, human genome project took, you know, decades or something and billions of dollars, and now you can send away a drop of blood, and for a couple hundred bucks, they can sequence your whole genome. Um, and so, of course, there's a ton of informatics-type uh, research involved in that, too. Uh, but we're going to be entering an age where we can uh, develop new biotherapies and, you know, even start thinking about manipulating our own genetic code, and that's going to open all kinds of, you know, crazy ethical questions in addition to interesting scientific ones. So I think that's really a kind of unexplored frontier, but, but could be pretty big in the next century. Great. So I'm going to close with one last question, and then if you have other questions, you can come up after and maybe ask the faculty then. What general advice do you have for engineering <coughs> students on a path? Find something you're passionate about and pursue it. I mean, you know, find, find whatever interests you, and it's going to be so much easier to persist when times get tough. If you've got genuine curiosity, you know, it's not going to be so much does this, you know, this project is due this day, I've got to get it done. It's like, I really want to know the answer to this because it, it intrigues me. And so, so it certainly makes all those things easier. Um, but, but work hard and, you know, don't do anything that's going to close a door down, down the road. Uh, you know, work a little harder just to keep your options open. You know, you may, not on a, you may not know at this moment if you want to go on to graduate school and be in school for nine years or whatever. Uh, but uh, if you keep, you know, if you, if you do well in your courses and uh, kind of keep that door open, then, then you're not going to be excluding options down the road once you have a better idea of what you want to do. Professors answer questions with questions. You're at a research university. Does anybody know what that means? In the classroom wing of the engineering center, there's a classroom wing. What goes on in the rest of it? <laughs> Who does all of that research? It ain't me. It's entirely students. Um, now, all research in years. Yeah, it, it really is very sad. We cry. Um, <laughs> So, following up on what he said, you're at a place that has more going on than any one person could ever know, and that's Engineers Without Borders out of his department. Uh, there's, uh, or no, uh, yes, yeah, um, make sure I get that right. Didn't want to uh, ascribe that wrong. Uh, I have four to five undergrad, paid undergrad researchers, didn't use the paid word, better than flipping burgers, um, in my lab every semester. So, get involved in things. You will learn 10 times more uh, struggling and crying in the lab late at night because the dang experiment won't work, um, then you will out of a textbook. And it's fun because that's why you're here. You're here to do it. And there's absolutely no reason to wait till four or five years from now to do it. Do it now. And that's, why, that's what this university is about because it's happening here. Yeah, following up on that, take advantage of all the broad different activities that you can uh, get into both academically and also uh, professionally, like Bob was mentioning, Engineers Without Borders, uh, Engineers for Developing Communities, and several other student organizations. Plus, even in the coursework, take as wide range of courses as you can, because you never know what you might need down the road. And what we just de described a little while ago in terms of what's coming ahead in our individual fields, as you can see, there are some common 
points where all these fields are merging. So which means to be able to operate in that, in that fluid world, you got to be familiar and comfortable uh, in a variety of different areas. So taking advantage of your time while you're here and, uh, and preparing yourself those kind of skills that are broad and they'll help you transition to any field as you move along. Go to class. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, go to class. Uh, check your email. Um, when it comes time to register for your classes next semester, be on time. You know, register as soon as you can so that you get first priority for those classes. Um, you know, I think when students struggle a lot of times it's because they, they skip class one too many times and then they can't get caught up. Or the professor sent out an email about something going on in the class and they don't check their email and so they didn't know it. Um, they waited too long to register and so they didn't get into that class that they needed. You know, these are all very boring, pragmatic things, but just, uh, yeah, go to class. And I have uh, two pieces of advice that I guess are um, more general than just for engineering students. The first, and this is based on my own personal experience, you know, take some risks, stretch yourself, uh, take a class that you're worried you can't pass, but you, know, you might learn that you can succeed and you'll actually learn a lot in that course. I regret uh, from my undergrad days not taking more difficult classes, not taking more classes, you know, I did my fair share of failing on tests anyway. Um, so what difference would another class have made? Um, and, you know, connected to this is to keep it in perspective. You know, one bad grade, one bad test, you know, it will, you know, go away. You'll forget about it five years from now. Um, but, you know, the experience of taking uh, classes that were difficult and challenged you, that will stick with you. The other piece of advice I give to a lot of uh, incoming students whenever I have the chance to speak with them is that uh, I'd encourage you to think about the value of your degree. And that doesn't just mean your opportunity to grow and become educated. These are important things. But there is an intrinsic value to your degree here. And that comes from your ability to get jobs that you want, internships that you want. And you know, that's based on the reputation of a CU degree. And that reputation comes from those that preceded you. You know, if someone from CU, maybe from the same department as you, went to a company and did terribly, what kind of chance do you think you have to get a job at that same company? It's not great. Okay, so you're all connected and you're actually all connected to us as well. Uh, so hold each other accountable, expect a lot from your professors and think about the actual monetary value of your degree. You know, you're paying or your parents are paying or someone at CU is paying for this degree and it can be returned to you with the jobs that you want, the internships that you want. Um, so you know, really work your hardest, take risks and definitely hold each other accountable. Please join me in thanking our faculty. I really want to thank you all for showing up, those of you who are here. Um, I really appreciate your attendance and your participation and great listening. Jared, Anthony, Olin, Amy, and Andrew, ask great questions. If you come up, I have a little something for you. The rest of you have a great evening, and I hope to see you at the next panel.